Yes, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Um, we have um, uh, the first webinar on open science where we are going to discuss uh, about uh, the Initiative for Science in Europe policy paper on the transition to open science. Um, this paper has not been published, it is in the state of a draft, but we will have a presentation uh, from uh, Thomas Susi, who has been coordinating the task force uh, from ESA on, on open science, and he is going to present what um, this draft is uh, trying to achieve. And then we have uh, him and uh, um, also, also Marco Massia uh, in discussion with us, so that we understand how this policy paper um, is meant to influence um, perhaps a European Union's uh, take on, 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 uh, on, uh, on open science and, and the role um, that we as an uh, um, uh, organization can have in shaping this, uh, this policy. So um, with no further uh, comment, maybe we should just get to, to the content of, of this policy paper uh, through Thomas Susi's presentation. Um, so, Rohan, if you can just bring him on stage, maybe, and let me disappear from here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me now. Good. So, thank you, Monica, very much for the invitation, and thank you, everyone, for coming to the seminar. As Monica said, we are at the final stages of preparing a report, so you will see the final product. But what I can share with you today, because we have not gone through um, um, an, an approval process with the member societies of ISE, so I can't share you all the findings, but I can share you um, some of the key findings of the report, kind of the big picture. Um, First of all, just a few words about myself. So I'm, I'm originally from Finland. I studied there at the Aalto University, uh, did my PhD uh, now 10 years ago, and then moved to Austria back in 2013, first with some national funding by the Austrian Science Fund, and then later on with the ERC, um, which starting grant I'm still, still running. And in 2018 to 2020, I was the vice chair of the Young Academy of Europe, which is a network of young scholars, uh, early career scholars uh, across all fields of science and uh, across all of Europe, um, and which is one of the ISC member societies or member organizations, which is how I, how I got into this uh, task force, which was established in 2020. And we decided to focus on the reward and evaluation systems because we, we thought that this is where the most important action needs to happen in the next, let's say, year or couple of years. And just a disclaimer that, that this presentation is not an official policy presentation from ISE. Um, it, is, it is my personal presentation, but of course I've been heading the task force, so I do have some insight into the, into the process and the report. So, um, I also am, am, am not able to, in this presentation, to justify why we want open science. So um, I hope you are more or less familiar with the concepts of it. We do provide in the report um, a brief summary, but we more or less assume that people understand what we mean when we say open science. So it's not just open access to publications, it's, it's much broader. And this is something that is on the European internationally as well, but on the European level, this has become under increasing focus. The European Commission is making open science a core part of its funding programs. And in the New Horizon Europe funding program, it will be a core part of proposals and actually part of the evaluation. And so there has been a lot of policy statements and recommendations over many years. Here's just two recent ones, um, a Commission policy an open science and the open science policy platform recommendations report where um, they very correctly identified that open science must be embedded at every level of the scientific endeavor and that all stakeholders need to take responsibility for supporting open science activities and and this i certainly agree with this is a, is a systemic issue however um when we were organizing the workshop, uh, we, we identified very quickly that it, it's very easy to have aspirations for open science and have all sorts of 
um, statements and recommendations and, and so on. But as long as the tenure and the promotion incentives and some to some degree grant incentives are working against open science, it's very hard to make progress on this. Um, and this is something that we really wanted to focus on, on, on changing or, or, or thinking about how we could change the incentive and, and, and evaluation structures within research, because that would allow us to, to move into open science, not only through uh, sticks, but also through some carrots that would actually motivate people to change how they, how they do science and how they publish their results. And the fact is that prestige is still the hard career currency. Um, there, there are any number of articles can be found, uh, studies, surveys, um, other sorts of quantitative and qualitative studies that show that journal impact factors and other prestige-based metrics or journal metrics are very critical in evaluating how we get hired and how we get promoted, how we achieve tenure and so on. So this is very much still reality, even though one would think that with all the, the words built against impact factors that we would have moved away from this, but that is that is unfortunately not the case. I have personally encountered this very much in the last years because I was applying for tenure track positions and then applying and fulfilling my tenure conditions. Um, and yeah, impact factors, article uh, journal quartile ranks, which is, you know, Q1 journals, this is nothing it's a different name for the same type of journal-based metrics, and 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 these are still used as key criteria on how people are evaluated uh, within research. I'm I'm sure there are field-dependent differences, and I would be very interested in hearing how it is in uh, in the fields covered by ESA. Um, I'm coming from physics myself, and and for us this is still very much the reality. And I I don't hope I don't have to convince you that the impact factor is a flawed metric, um, especially for evaluating individuals, because it is a journal level metric and it was never meant to be for uh, a metric to use to use for evaluating individuals. And yet that's how it's very often misused. And there's many, 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 many papers, uh, articles, op op editorials, op-eds, whatever. Um, so you can you can certainly find a lot of criticism of the impact factor and this go down a, back a long time so for example on the on the left here the bmj editorial or maybe it wasn't editorial but B, bmj 1997 why the impact factor of journals should not be used for evaluating research and yet almost 15 years later we're still doing it so this is really a big problem and and it is really hindering any sort of transition to open science because of course the impact factor does not care uh, any anything about whether something is open or not and uh, just this spring um, I wrote on or we wrote together uh, an opinion piece with with two colleagues so I was working at the Young Academy of Europe uh, Matthias Björnmalm was working for the Marie Curie Alumni Association and Veredik the head was working for Eurodoc. So our three organizations were collaborating quite a lot on science policy, uh, especially around Plan S. And those were the, the people uh, that were kind of interfacing very much in the three organizations. So these all, all represent early career researchers to some degree. And so we wrote together this, um, this opinion piece that has gotten quite a bit of attention and, and very positive feedback, where we basically say that the, the current game, the prestige game that we are forced to play is actually having a number of adverse impacts and it is preventing all sorts of beneficial uh, reform that, that we would like to see and, and open science is, is an important aspect of that. And we were kind of giving perspectives from different career stages. So Veronique was at the time still a PhD candidate, now she's, she has graduated since, but, but she Point out, pointed out very correctly that even though she is very knowledgeable about open science, she still had to publish in a certain way to, to have a career in science. And I think that's very fair to say, and, and, and I personally very strongly believe that no researcher was, should have to martyr themselves for openness. Uh, we, we can do what we can, but, but we should not ignore what the current realities of the evaluation and the career system are. 
And I personally have been advocating for open access for a long time, more than a decade now. I have published a lot of open access, but still only in journals that I felt that um, were, were, were valuable for advancing my career. So I've been playing this game the same as anybody else who manages to, to, to um, succeed in academia. And now that I am tenured, uh, in principle, I wouldn't have to care about this so much anymore, but I have PhD um, trainees, I have postdocs, and their careers are tied to the current system still. So I actually um, still have to select where we publish in a way that supports their careers rather than perhaps um, choosing where we would publish in terms of just the most suitable outlet or the most open outlet. And so I'm also still locked into this system, even though I'm tenured. And, and Matthias has still, since moved um, to from a researcher to an advocacy career, and he's working at Caesar and trying to kind of change the system from within. And in the, in our in our opinion piece, we go through a number of arguments, but we we in the end identify the steps that we need for a transition to open science, um, or act, actually more broadly, how to change the the culture of of research evaluation and the the kind of captivation with prestige-based metrics that, that actually cause a lot of stress and even scientific misconduct because the, the pressures are so high. And how do we, how do we change this? Well, uh, first we, as a research community and, and uh, researchers across all career stages, we really need to just be very honest about how are we evaluating each other and what is the current system and and really see its flaws. You know, maybe we never had a problem. We had a good career. Maybe 20 years ago, if we, uh, some more senior researchers didn't really see the problems in the current system, well, the younger people are increasingly seeing them. And, and, and we all have to face that this system is not a good system and it is not scientific, first of all. And what we also identified is that, that we really need some some finally, um, don't long overdue, we need some dialogue within the research community to actually decide what is important, what should be rewarded, and how should individual uh, researchers be evaluated at different stages of their careers. And, and, and that's unfortunately where we are now. So, so we, there is increasing acceptance of the fact that we need to move away from impact factors, but we haven't really decided, we haven't made, a, made an agreement on, okay, what should we evaluate instead? And that will probably be field, field specific. And so to try to tease this apart, um, we organized this workshop um, by the Initiative for Science in Europe uh, back in March. Unfortunately, as a virtual, virtual workshop uh, because of the continuing pandemic, but we tried to have a number of different stakeholders from different stages and different levels of the research system to, to discuss, okay, what, what, should, what could we do to, to change the reward system and, and, and especially how to change the reward system in a sense that would, would reward open science practices, which would then help us improve the transparency and, and reproducibility of, of research. And here on the bottom, if you're not familiar with ISC, it, they are the, the member organizations, so there's a number of larger scientific societies uh, in Europe, and then the young researcher organizations, as, as mentioned in the beginning. And, and one, one point that, that we brought from the beginning is that we actually have enough indicators. We don't need to create new lists of possible indicators that, um, that could be rewarded. Um, the, the Open Science Policy Platform has listed uh, dozens and dozens of different possible indicators and have even made a Open Science Career Assessment Matrix uh, kind of as a proposal of what could be evaluated, but there is no agreement on any of this. These are just proposals that haven't really been accepted or adapted um, almost anywhere. So there are some, some pioneering institutions like Leiden, for example, and, and some entire countries like the Netherlands that are trying to change the system but we, we, we need a lot more discussion on actually what do we want to reward and how do we want to evaluate people. And so the, the works of framing was, was that we should discuss which practices should be rewarded. We should discuss and decide what evaluation should be based on. Should it be quantitative? Should it be qualitative? Should it be a mixture of the two? Um, can these scale? Can, can qualitative evaluation scale into all situations or should they maybe used in some context and not in others. 
And then, of course, the, the million dollar question or million euro question, how can a change in, in the culture be achieved? And this probably will take a lot of time. So we're not um, we're not naive about that. And then in terms of, of of the stakeholders, so who should actually be responsible for driving change and what could different stakeholders do to, 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 to cause this reform to come into play? And as key policy goals, we 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 kind of almost reiterated uh, things that have been said before, because these are kind of obvious. So people and institutions should be evaluated and rewarded based on their merits rather than prestige or other inappropriate indicators, especially like journal impact factors. Um, and to that end, to, to, to enable this, uh, we need to identify suitable indicators, maybe not even indicators necessarily in terms of quantitative metrics, but just what should we be looking at when we when we evaluate and reward people and ideally we would want those to align with other outcomes for science that we want such as transparency uh, reproducibility and, and robustness of the outcomes and of the process itself and and to make this really happen and, and create those incentives we should we should create these career rewards that reward whatever we decide or whatever each community decides that they want to reward at each stage of the research careers and each level of the research system. And for implementing this and, and for kind of looking at the different stakeholders, so we identified three levels, pretty conventional. So in the top down, you have policymakers, funders and governments. And that is really where a lot of the action is happening, but it's mainly been happening on the, on the level of mandates. So you have to do this or else. And the carrots uh, have been somewhat missing. Then on the intermediate level, you have universities and research institutions. And of course, there are, as I said, some pioneers who are implementing new systems to a large part, as I showed in my personal tenure conditions, for example, universities still use uh, journal-based prestige indicators to, to evaluate people. And then on the bottom up, um, researchers have, many researchers have been vocal advocates for these things, and, and that's important. But perhaps even more important would be for different communities uh, of researchers and perhaps academies of science to take a more active role um, to actually driving this, this reform and deciding, and deciding what should be rewarded and, and then driving the reform and actually changing the culture. And for all stakeholders, we, we basically were able to find options for action, very concrete proposals, what they could do uh, in terms of setting policy for advocacy and training and for the actual rewarding then. And of course, these will be adapted to different stakeholders because something that applies to a government may not be the same as uh, applies to a university. Um, for publishers, we, we did include them there, but, but only in the sense that they would be service providers. So publishers don't really have such a big role in, in this evaluation process because this is something that the research community internally does. So tool creation is something that they can still do to support um, support these changes, but it, they're not really a key player, and nor, they sh nor should they be any key, key player in this transition. And so our key conclusion is that it is really urgent and vital that research communities really concretely consider what do we want to reward. We, we can't just keep on saying that we want to move away from impact factors. We have to decide how, what do we replace them with or a completely new way of evaluation, if that's possible. But, it, but we, we need to make concrete proposals. Um, we need to have the concrete discussions and then make concrete proposals on what to, what to change. And then, of course, the other side of the coin is that decision makers need to engage with, with such communities, meaning us, basically, researchers in planning the reforms. Um, it's still, you know, it, there, there often seems to be a little bit of a disconnect that, that from the top down there comes policies and it wasn't very clear, like, where researchers really fully consulted in, in, in making these policies. And that has also caused some backlash, which is, of course, uh, hindering further progress. And so we need both sides to engage. We need the communities to come up with proposals and we need decision makers to take, take this into account. And, and I personally very, very strongly feel that unless we can agree urgently what to re replace these indicators such as impact factors and quartile ranks, um, somebody else will either, either um, place new indicators on us or these indicators will simply not go away. Because if we don't come up with, with better solutions, 
uh, it's going to be status quo or then then some policymakers will impose indicators on us that we may not agree with. And so it's really up to us, up to researchers and research communities to decide. Uh, we all realize that the, the, or most of us realize that the current system is not ideal. So we should come up with constructive uh, proposals on how to how to improve it. And I'm not the only one uh, who has recognized this. I, I saw this in a, in a webinar. Jean-Claude Borgelman also pointed out that, you know, uh, we only know what we don't want. So we know we want to get away from these indicators, but we, we don't have any agreement on what to replace them with. And, and, and no concrete proposals on how actually change the reward system. And I, I do have to say that this to me, stand, from this point of point, of point in time, to me, this is the biggest biggest uh, hurdle in, in that that is preventing us from really moving to a much more open uh, science system. And just to conclude on that, um, evaluation is really in our hands. This is something that is done by the research community to itself, and this is quite different to open access, where where where, where uh, private companies own a lot of the publishing and, and of the journals. But here, it's really a lot of this is just researchers evaluating each other. Um, there is the systemic level that governments also evaluate institutions. And of course, that does require some, some, pol some political advocacy. But still, you know, who does the government listen to in terms of research evaluation? I mean, hopefully, ultimately, research communities, uh, at least the more pr prestigious ones. So we really can change evaluation because it's something that we do to ourselves. And incidentally, of course, if we did move away from journal prestige, uh, there would be a lot more room for many novel and innovative publishing initiatives that, that maybe would bring down costs and, and increase things like reproducibility and, and, and all that. So um, this is something that, that we really could change if we wanted to, but we are, we are kind of in a, in a bind because whoever acts first has, has some disadvantage and there's a huge coordination problem. And, it's a very systemic multi-level problem. So I'm not saying this is easy, but there is nothing fundamentally standing in the way of, of rather big changes in this. All right, that was all I had prepared in terms of the presentation. So I'd be happy to then move on to discussion or however you wanted to run this, Monica. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe, maybe I should bring uh, Mark also here so that we can see him. So he's... Uh, the executive coordinator for uh, ESA. And, and just a few words, maybe um, probably people have sort of understood why uh, uh, why we have invited you here is, as you said, each community should decide what we want to reward. Uh, so we as anthropologists, we also should decide what we want to reward. But j just to give a bit of a background, because um, I, I was also in this task force and I remember the discussions we had at the beginning where I sort of said, uh, uh, well, it's open science maybe, but or open sciences because it, we don't exactly have the same mode of evaluation and the same hierarchies of science in, in anthropology, which probably is not true given that we already have differences between different European countries and their ways of I imagining how, how we should be evaluated or not. And basically what I was saying is that at least here in France, we didn't have this pressure of the impact factor in anthropology. So somehow, uh, uh, for me, it was a discovery to see that uh, open access and, and um, the creation of new journals that would be uh, open um, could change the hierarchies of science. That, that was a discovery for me. For me, it wasn't that that was governing uh, Monica, our way. But Monica, you have been I, very convincing. Can I quickly ask, have you heard no. of Q1 journals? Sorry? Have you heard of journal citation report and Q1 journals? Now, of course we did, uh, we did. But, but however, we, we, we have managed sort of turn around and not make it dominate our, our own life as, as scientists. But, but again, I, I'm not again a doctoral or a postdoctoral student, so maybe I don't feel the pressure as, as they feel it um, in the same well, way. Lucky, lucky field and lucky country, because there are big differences between different fields and, and geographical regions. So, but, but I assure you, this is not the norm. So, so what, what I found really interesting here in, in, in the whole attempt uh, that, that you were having is to, to, to find out um, uh, discipline by discipline somehow uh, and, and look uh, from a bottom-up perspective what the research community would have 
to say about with what to uh, replace the impact factor. Um, and speaking of which, maybe um, um, maybe a first question for Mark of this, we should benefit from his presence here, is that you said evaluation is in our hands as community, and, and I was wondering how, how can we actually do it? And, and what was um, what is the way in which you think this, uh, the fact that we are talking together, uh, consulting each other and issuing policy papers could actually have an impact in the way in which uh, science would be done in Europe. Uh, so maybe maybe uh, if, if Marco, you can tell us about what are your hopes when giving us the voice. Yes, th this is a very good question. Let's say that uh, there are different avenues here and different things to, to be considered. And I would say that there is first, let's say, a conversation with other stakeholders, like policymakers, first of all, founders, and so forth and so on. And there is also the conversation towards our communities, right? So the way we are, we, we are still thinking about it, but the, the way I would like to do things is that uh, go both ways. So once the report will be ready, and uh, as, as Thomas mentioned, the draft is almost finished, so we will circulate it to, to the experts. We invited to the workshop first, and then to our, uh, our member societies for getting feedback. And then after that, we will publish it, right? So now uh, let's first uh, think about policymakers. Right. So we, we will bring our conclusions to different policymakers and founders in uh, different venues. So, for example, we have already established, a, I would say, a quite good uh, relationship with uh, the cabinet of Commissioner Gabriel and with the DG RTD. And actually, we are in constant contact with the DG RTD and also with the um, unit uh, of open science there. OK, and, and, and there are actually we agree on, on, on many things, okay? Uh, of course, um, and, and actually in, in just in, in next week, we are gonna have uh, a, another conversation out of a consultation they are, they are making with other stakeholders. So this is one of the ways to push it to policymakers, uh, right? And, and then of course, this consultation will be one, we had other, other calls before and we will have other contacts afterwards of course and uh, and these and, and the, the more capillary we can be in terms of reaching out to policymakers the better so ideally but this is very difficult to do uh, we would have uh, to reach out also to policymakers in different member states and this is for two reasons first of all because still most of the decision about how uh, let's say science uh, research is is conducted conducted is uh, made at, at the member state level and secondly as uh, thomas said before and you too right there are different geographies so different ways uh, of approaching research and actually when we were working on on this draft that was already quite advanced i had the opportunity to talk to some uh, friends of mine who are professors of physics in a quite excellent university in italy and then I was commenting about our, our uh, perspective and I was asking how it works in their universities. And, and they told me, oh, no, we just recruit based on um, bibliometrics. So age index, impact factor and, and number of publications. These are the three things that are still used in Italy, right? So it's very important to reach out to policymakers in Italy, for example, but also in other countries. To make them aware that there is that there is this transition and we are pushing in that direction so uh, we would like to work with them and as i said this is a very ambitious and very difficult one way of reaching out to those policymakers is through our member societies so um just for, for the ones online that maybe don't know isc is an umbrella organization that is collecting many learned societies or, or scientific societies and young researchers organizations so that all uh, these societies have uh, as members national members right and some uh, society have very strong uh, let's say a very strong foothold in some of the member states and what we would like to to, to do is through our member societies uh, open a channel of conversation with those policymakers. 
So this is like very quickly how we would reach to, to those stakeholders and then the internal conversation, because as we say, researchers should be uh, on the driver's seats, right? So make this decision and, and really uh, stop saying we should do something with, uh, without taking any actions, right? So again, what we would like to do is work with our member societies and maybe in the future also other societies that are not members to, to push um, not only the, the paper itself, but uh, to push for taking the initiative around something like, for example, in some member societies, uh, uh, the membership is, is by nomination, right? So uh, how do you do the nomination? What do you include in your, in, in your criteria for nomination? If, if, you, if they include or not uh, open science indicators, it's um, it's important, right? And or, or maybe for their awards or any other things that uh, different societies might, many activities that different societies are, are, are doing, right? It, it just push towards the inclusion of, of some incentives uh, towards this transition to open science. And we haven't started yet working in, with uh, our members in that direction because we want we would like to have the 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 paper out first and then work in that direction but this is this is why we have invited you because we'd like to be able to be to be relaying what, what you have been doing at, at the initiative of science in europe i had however a question uh, and, and maybe perhaps for you or for toma um this um open science movement and this sort of big change in the hierarchy of science seems to be uh, very much directed towards the European Union, obviously, and then through there to the member states. But we do work in an international environment where we publish in American journals and they have their impact factors, which is quite important. And this is part of our landscape, actually. It doesn't stop at, 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 the, um, uh, at the gates of Europe. So um, how European is this movement, actually? We know uh, about the DORA, maybe, statement uh, was in San Francisco, so that sort of pushes us to the American side, but we, we don't know how uh, how popular is open science uh, um, in other parts of the world. So maybe, Tom, uh, you, you're more, more aware. I can say say some things about that. So the, the US federal government has had a very progressive open access policy long before Europe had any. So National Institutes of Health, for example, and the US Department of Energy and big research fund, federal research funders have had very progressive open access policies, you know, for two decades. So it's not like this is new in the US context either. Um, of course, now with, with, with Plan S, Europe is trying to trying to move from embargoes, let's say six or 12 months to immediate open access. And that's still something that the US, in the US on the federal level hasn't happened. Um, but there's a lot of activity on open science, lots of activity on open data as well. But 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 I think Europe is taking a lead, and Europe is taking a lead very purposefully. Uh, this is a this is a very conscious decision by European Commission to say that we want to be forerunners in this. We don't want to be following what the Americans are doing, but we wanna we wanna move forward and actually be the pioneers in this. And of course, that may carry some risks, but um, it might also carry some benefits if we are able to to improve the way science is conducted in Europe and and improve the reproducibility and and, and uh, the reuse of European science that might increase the impact of European science. And then, you know, US journals can keep their impact factors. That doesn't matter. What matters is that we decide what we want to reward. And so it, it doesn't matter if there are prestigious American journals, you know, we can still keep on publishing in them. We just should not evaluate each other based on what is the name of the journal, but based on actually what is in the, what is in the research. But talking of which, you said that open science has been living uh, and, and well in the United States for the past 20 years. But talking with people who, who are professors in, in the US, for them, the open science was just a tax they were paying. You know, when they are having their research grants, they have to put some money aside for <laughs> paying Wiley or, or some other journal so that they open the data. So um, that's how they presented to me open science. They said, oh, we, we had it for a long time. It's a tax. That's just just more correction i mean that would be for open access right if the data doesn't cost anything to open data you can just put on a repository so that would probably be the article processing fees right okay oh, we do have some questions uh and i'd like to to see whether 
Um, Maria, would you like to come on stage? Maybe to ask some of the questions. Maybe it's easier because we have some space for a podium. Hi, Maria. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for being here, and I'm really happy that the EASA ISC communication continues also on this on this venue. Thanks also to Monica. And so my two questions that I also posted, um, one is more a question, the other is more a comment. So I'm, you know, coming from the UK experience where the, I think in, in the whole of Europe, there's no more stricter kind of evaluation framework than the REF. It's completely abusive and, and nasty. But, but there have been attempts by colleagues, you know, through the TEF or the KEF, you know, the knowledge exchange framework and, and so forth, to introduce other criteria of evaluation. Now, the problem in the UK is that, that those have just come on top rather than, you know, rather than making evaluation more varied, it has just added more work for us as academics to submit reviews and, you know, just, it's a hell. But, um, but, but my question is, you know, like, Aren't we throwing the baby out with the bathwater when we only speak of ourselves as researchers? Because what you were saying, Thomas, like we are also educators. We have students. We have a kind of um, impact in in a community, especially in the social sciences in society. Ideally, and it's not that the natural sciences don't have impact on society. So, so it's for me that the conversation perhaps has to shift a bit uh, to taking all these aspects into account because otherwise, and that's kind of coming to my second question, I think while we're still, and I'd say continental Europe and some semi-peripheries like, I know, South Africa, parts of Latin America, are now very much coming to uh, Eastern Europe as well, coming to this idea that, you know, now we'll have to really catch up with the US and the UK and do excellent research and have our universities featured in league tables and I don't know what. At the same time, I have been doing some research with like, um, people like policymakers in OECD, the World Bank, um, U UNESCO and so forth, you know, about, um, you know, how they see the role of research and honestly, they don't care about research. So what they care about is this whole new digital shift that makes universities even more of a commodity when it comes to teaching and students ever more of a commodity, I mean, kind of freely uh, product that employers can grab from us, you know? So, so the, the terms of conversation among these institutions is completely not where we are. So I'm just kind of wondering you know, do you see in the in the policy communities where you're having your conversation any possibility to bring these topics in, you know, of teaching and or or do we have to catch to research because that's even pulled under our feet? Yeah, I mean, big big questions and big themes. So for our report, we we did focus on research because, of course, I also work in a university. And I do teaching and, and find teaching to be very important. And I think teaching should be part of any academic reward system. But there's not so much a problem with that, right? Like it should maybe be valued more. The weight should be higher because currently, like I got hired for my publications. I did not get hired for my teaching. It was a small part of the tenure package. And I'm sure, you know, even if I had had very poor teaching grades and excellent publications, I still would have been hired. So maybe that needs to change. But in our report, we, we focus on where the biggest problems are, which is the research evaluation. Um, yeah, so we, we have to focus it somewhere. Um, but yeah, I do agree that teaching is an important part and should also be rewarded and should be part of this, this modified reward system and maybe have a, have a bigger weight. Um, when it comes to efforts that we have to make, yeah, I... I published open data sets. It takes effort to do metadata and do everything correctly and publish those. They don't really get currently cited. They are very good for the reproducibility of my research, but I'm not rewarded from them. So currently it does very often feel like extra effort. And, and, and that's something that's one part of our um, options for stakeholders is a core recommendation will be that 
Uh, anybody who wants to mandate open science needs to re recognize that this requires resources and there needs to be perhaps dedicated uh, staff for that data curation to help us with, with these, these types of issues or just more time for doing evaluations in a different way. So, um, yeah, this is definitely a concern. But I think like, you know, if, if, if we do an effort to publish a paper and make very careful open data and, and make this research piece of research potentially much more impactful, we should be rewarded more for that. And then when we have rewards that are commensurate with the extra effort, then it just becomes part of our normal research workflow potentially with some some external help um, and yeah then about international institutions and, and how they value education more um, yeah it, it kind of we didn't really discuss that in this context perhaps this is something that um, could come moving forward but but I think that the biggest problems currently are in the way research assessment is conducted that affects how research is published, how what are the pressures on people's careers, and then that actually may have adverse effects on research outcomes as well. And then it, it leads to all sorts of problems like transparency, lack of transparency, lack of reproducibility, and then this affects what it gets communicated to the to the public and what gets to into our textbooks and part of education. So it all kind of starts from research, and and there are glaring problems there that that, that should be fixed. So. But yeah, it's a very complex multi-level system and there are other aspects that we just couldn't consider. Thank you it, very much. May um, I add something on what has been said? Yes, and actually we should recognize a, a couple of things. First of all is that we are now in this transition towards open science, right? So uh, until a few years ago, nobody was speaking of open science. So few people were practicing it, but I mean, it was just a very small minority of people doing right and now there is this push uh, uh, mostly uh, from from uh, from let's say the european commission and policymakers in europe uh, towards open science and why there is this push uh, and let's say that we are all agreeing what uh, thomas said because this guarantees more transparency so that that will affect the pro possibly more trust in, in, in scientists and research in general and and it, it will also improve the quality of science okay so this is the vision that we have and, and that we share also with with uh, pushing towards the transition but of course as you said the fact that it might require an effort or resources of, or both right um, is a hurdle to make this transition smoothless. So that's why we need to focus on the incentives and rewards there, just to kind of catalyze or kind of accelerate this transition there. Because if there are no incentives, then why should the person spend uh, half a day in let's say, making their data uh, open, right? Or things like that. And so that's why we, we decided to focus only on these aspects and but of course what you said it's it's all legitimate and it and are all very legitimate concerns uh, but of course we we, uh, we just wanted to to consider this transition to open science because we consider that it's very important also it's a face in the future for the quality of research in europe thank you very much uh, maria if you have uh, finished the questions maybe annalise morse said that she uh, she was having a question i should Hello. Yes, hello. Thank you very much. Uh, I very much agree with the uh, with the criticism of the journal metrics, and I'm also very much in favor of open access. But I have serious doubts about how open science is going to work for different disciplines because the, the way I hear this being presented here is much more a kind of open science that would fit for quantitative research, that would fit for the sciences, but would be highly problematic for ethnography. And what we have been seeing in our university is that in the course of time, we have this continuous um, push from the sciences, but also from, for instance, the quantitative sociologists in our field A, to pay much more attention as anthropologists to journal metrics, etc., because it's really from those fields right, that is much more crucial, I think, than in our field. Although I think also in anthropology it does occur. It's not as if you know it doesn't occur. That's one thing. 
but especially the open science, the push for open science now, and, and in particular when that is going to be also a moment of evaluation, we can already notice that when anthropologists have the argument, which is one of our main arguments, the confidentiality of our data, why we cannot make our field notes open science, where we cannot make, where we cannot anonymize our interviews, etc., because that would take away all the, all the actually the, the strong points of our work, that this is held against us in evaluations in which also other disciplines are involved. So I would really like to hear a, a little bit more sensitivity about the specificity of disciplines and especially the, the, the difference in epistemological positions in the field to take that a little bit more on. And I also hear it, for instance, when you talk about, you know, we need money for making our data sets public. Well, I would argue as an anthropologist, if we need money, we would need it, for instance, to enable us to publish easier in the language of our interlocutors. Because if we publish, in, if I translate my work in Arabic, there's nobody who cares about it except the people who would read it, right? My university couldn't care less. It doesn't count for anything. So that was what I would like to add, discipline. Mm, mm, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think what it's true there's a there, there probably is a is a bias for for coming from stem fields more in, in these discussions because that's where the kind of movement got started in a yeah. way um but i think what the eu is recognizing in their open data mandates is that some data just cannot be made public and that is okay mm -hmm. you know, as open as possible as closed as necessary yeah. is is a is a slogan that they use and i think that's mm -hmm. fine not everything needs to be open but but what can be open probably should be open mm -hmm. so there there is probably a different balance that that is very disciplinary as you say um yeah getting getting research published in different languages i mean maybe maybe machine learning tools will be something that will be very helpful in making automatic translations because it probably won't be economical to do this in many many different languages mm -hmm. Of course, if you have a specific country you're focusing on, then that single translation might be good. Yeah, I, I, that goes well beyond my own expertise to say whether, whether we could get some funds for that. Thank you very much for this comment, which, which is actually very much in line with what I also wanted to ask Marco. I mean, Marco, did you find that there are lots of differences in the position of different members from different uh, European associations that come under the umbrella of ESA regarding open science? Um, yeah, actually, this is a very, it was a very good comment also because uh, we noticed it in the, in the discussion, right? So the, there are the different uh, perspectives from all the disciplines. And as you said, for example, for data, the problem is also for uh, medical records, for example, right? Or in some cases, people are kind of um, jealous about the intellectual property, not jealous, but concerned about the intellectual property and, and, and uh, concerned that by... by uh, having the data open might be might backfire or things like that. So in, in ISC, we have many disciplines. Luckily, we have both uh, STEM and SSH. So we have always a, a balanced view on that, uh, which is good. And uh, the comments, uh, just to complement what Thomas says about uh, data, it's also true that um, it's enough to have the, uh, the metadata, right, about your data. So you don't need to disclose any confidential information. You just have to describe what your data uh, contains. That, that, that would be more than enough already. But these are already, I would say, a bit of uh, nitty gritty details that change uh, for, um, by disciplines. And it's, this is one of the reasons why we say that it's the, 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 the disciplines themselves, the researchers from different disciplines themselves, that have to find out how to include uh, these incentives and rewards uh, ready to open science in their own communities, right? Because we are very well aware that it's completely different from physics to, to anthropology, right? And, and, and you have many flavors in between. Uh, and of course, you cannot implement the same assessment rewards, incentives that you have in physics uh, and take them as, as they are and bring it to anthropology. Of course, it, it doesn't make any sense, right? And so it's it's up to the community then to just get together and decide. And this decision, in my opinion at least, 
is a kind of a try and error because you cannot know a priori what will work fine and what not. Of course, you will have a, 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 let's say, a general idea of how it might work, right? But not until you try it. So the earlier, let's say, you, you, you engage with your own communities uh, to find out what the best way of uh, uh, using these rewards and, or, or let's say forming the assessment um, and the evaluation system is the better okay so this is I, i'm just uh, kind of uh, um, sending back the question to you and to your community to the people that are here now but also the ones who are not here you just need to start within your own communities when, whenever you, you make any assessment and try to see okay how do we include the fact that for example uh, our data cannot be too much open or mm -hmm. for example i know that you publish a lot of monographies and books rather than many articles right so of course it's it's a different world also in, in that sense but then it's good to to to, to have a look at it let's say from this open science perspective and understand that if you incentivize the, the take of those practices in your community it will be better for your community. Thank you very much. I, I saw there was a question from David, uh, David I think, but it, however, I think it was linked to something else. So, uh, David, I shall bring you on stage, but I'm not sure whether your question is still in tune with what we are saying. I'm so sorry we made you wait. No, it's fine. It, it's um, it, This is very helpful and very interesting. And I mean, it, 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 is, it is important to highlight that Obviously, things are vary by field, and um, it, it, the initiative does have mostly science associations. But as but as as, some, as Tuman um, noted, there is also the educationalists and the social psychologists. My my question is really a different one, which is, um, science relies on credibility, doesn't it? I mean, I think you know, there's there's no there's no knowledge without without that knowledge being tested as credible. So somewhere or other, we have to have some sort of valuation now you're absolutely right that the, the the metricization of that evaluation and that use of those metrics wrongly is absolutely the, the core of the problem but can we separate out the, the problems with evaluation with the problems of the rest of the infrastructure i guess you know my, my question is can we just focus on evaluation without thinking about the structures that determine the evaluation so, so in particular for example there's been a great push towards open access. That's been wonderful. But of course, most of the models, especially in the sciences of open access, are APC driven, um, which means that, um, that, that you know, inevitably it's harder for this, you know, the societies, many of whom own their own journals, it's harder for them to really challenge the, the, their relationship with elite publishers because, because those elite publishers, uh, even if they do go open access and find some sort of big deal or some sort of way of dealing with it, that they're, they're still structuring around a certain form of, of prestige game. So, so I guess my question really is, can we talk about evaluation and the, the problems of a research evaluation without thinking about the political economy of the infrastructures that make knowledge and how that might need to be changed as well? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, to some degree, I think we've been, we've been tackling the, the kind of the wrong end of the problem. Like if we were not captive to commercial journal brands, you know, that the question of infrastructure would be much less, we, we could have free and very cheap platforms. And so we have funders and policymakers have been trying to tackle the, the, the infrastructure first by making mandates for open access. And that has had all sorts of perhaps unintended consequences and, and some remain to be seen. And yeah, society funding is one big question because I think society, some societies have frankly an unhealthy relationship with these journals. So, but but if we were to be able to to free ourselves from outsourcing evaluation, our evaluation systems to commercial entities, I think there would be a lot more room for doing open access and open science in a much more cheap way, and and not, not impose new barriers for publishing. Although I do have to always remember in these discussions that we have already been paying about four thousand five hundred euros per article in the subscription system. If you count all the subscription spending and all the articles, you know, we have been paying enormous sums of money for this system. Mm -hmm. And so even if we pay APCs of a couple of thousand euros, we're still getting a cheaper outcome compared to the old system, which is in addition open. But I agree, you know, it should not cost 3,000 or 5,000 euros to publish an article. And why does it cost it? Because 
frankly, for me as a researcher, it is worth paying 5,000 euros, especially if it's not my money. You know, <laughs> it definitely, it, for me personally, in terms of my career benefits, uh, a publication in Nature Communications is well worth it. So those incentives need to change and then the publishing system can change. And we've been kind of trying to tackle it the other way around. Okay. Um, I remember on all these discussions around the draft um, of ESA, there was this fear that uh, uh, the quality would be less if we are going for open access uh, journals that have all sort of appeared. So it, it wasn't just a matter of prestige, it was a matter of uh, uh, some journals and some platforms have a certain tradition and, and certain quality with which they work and and, uh, and these people also are making their lives uh, out of that. I mean, they're editors and publishers. We we like to work with who are, who are um, very uh, competitive uh, uh, professionals. Uh, so how how not to lose this? Uh, I mean, this is not all bad. Uh, how not to lose this quality, this eye, uh, which might be maybe less important in some disciplines, but at least in anthropology, uh, where it is about wording and <laughs> not making mistakes, uh, it, it is important. So is there a, a plan? Or no. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a couple of thoughts on that. Like, um, there has been a lot of conflation happening. So there has been a conflation between commercial publisher, bad society, good. And that is that is too black and white. So for example, the American Chemical Society, uh, their top leadership gets paid paid one million dollars per year in salaries funded by this publication, uh, subscription cops and publication fees. Are they somehow, you know, uh, they are society, so they're automatically good, right? And, and, and they have been opposing open access for a long time. They've been opposing open citations. They've been having very regressive policies, despite being a, so a society publisher. And, and some commercial publishers perhaps are, are better actors than that. And so that's one conflation that's been there. And the other is, 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 is the conflation of quality with, with, with the journal brand. Um, I have published in many, many high impact journals. Sometimes they have very good peer review, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they have very cursory peer review, uh, clearly by people who don't really understand the article fully. They maybe ask you to cite, you know, one paper that's probably their paper. And then the article is passed through. I have not seen super strong evidence personally in the journals I have published between the whether the journal is open access or not, whether it's high prestige or not. I mean, the very, very top, I think um, there's so much more scrutiny and, and also lots of editorial scrutiny. So that may play some role. Um, so I think that the, the answer to that, how do we ensure quality? Uh, make the peer reviews open. You know, if you don't want to publish the identities of the reviewers, I, I understand that there are concerns with that. Publishing the text of the review alongside the article, then everybody can see, okay, what was the criticism? What were the answers? What were the revisions to the article? That's a way to ensure quality and actually demonstrate the quality. And it would actually demonstrate in a much stronger way than two anonymous people who offer some comments, you make some revisions, the editor has a subjective role to play as well, whether they demand some changes to be made or they, they say that you can ignore that. You know, they have a lot of freedom in this system. And, and then the, the public only sees the final product and none of these quality assurance steps. So I think that's one way that we really, sh and, and that is a core part of open science, of, of making the peer review process also more open. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of a red herring. I think there is a lot of conflation between quality and prestige. Um, which may or may not be there. And then we have the means within open science to ensure that we keep, nobody is, like, almost nobody is advocating that we abandon peer review. So that is, that is still going to be part of the new system. Whether it happens perhaps, you know, first a preprint, then open peer review, post preprint, maybe some formal acceptance, that maybe the form of it will change, but we will still have expert evaluations so and we can just make them more open. Thank you. I, I see that Sharon is having a question, so maybe I bring uh, David down. <laughs> Thank you, David. See you. Uh, hopefully that... Sorry, I'm trying to... Am I there yet? Am I visible? 
click, click, automatic clicking. Sorry, can you hear me? I hear yes. you. So you can't see me. I can't see me. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Ah, maybe that'll do it. Oh, sorry, I've lost my camera. Um, I'll, I'll just speak then. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, part of my question is about what we're meaning by open, because there are a lot of different things involved here. And I guess from different disciplines, um, there might be different takes on some of those. And I'm especially pleased um, that uh, uh, Annalisa raised the points that I wanted to make. But as you just mentioned this one about um, the transparency of the process, so there's a general thing about transparency, um, which I think in many cases makes absolute sense. But you, I did really get, when I was just thinking about that last example, if another sense we have of open is opening up to um, a bigger range of people and people from different uh, parts of the world, or we might hear be saying different parts of Europe, to participate, whether some of those could really play against it. And I was thinking, um, if I come from a place where it, there's very good provision, and before I submit my article, I've got loads of support, I might be happy to submit something where the peer reviews will be uh, readable by people afterwards. But if I'm coming from somewhere where that's not the case, I think I feel really uh, pretty worried about doing that. And I just wonder about those possibilities of some of these transparencies, uh, you know, could run the other way. And I just wondered if that's something that had um, come up at all. Mm, mm. Not, not, in, not in so explicit ways. Uh, I, I think it could be a concern, but it could also be that you know, there's there's probably a lot of unconscious bias that goes into evaluation when you're evaluating people with bad English or, uh, you know, poor English writing skills or coming from a not so famous institution or a country that is not known for its research. And maybe a lot of that unconscious bias nowadays gets hidden in the in the non-transparent forms of peer review. So it could go either way. And I think we actually need more studies. To, to look at this and th there are some publishers who have done some studies but i think we need a lot more actual studies on, on how this works and what are the adverse versus beneficial effects but we we didn't encounter this question explicitly to, to my recollection what do you think marco yeah i mean we we didn't consider this um thoroughly we were more let's say focused on, on the on the uh, conflation of open with prestige or open with excellence, actually. But uh, yes, of course, we give for granted that transparency is always good. Uh, consider that in some cases, this trans transparency. Oh, now we can see you. <laughs> Found it. <laughs> it became it visible and transparent <laughs> to me. <laughs> now you are more transparent. <laughs> So yeah, consider that this transparency can come also with uh, anonymity sometimes. So I, I totally understand that in some places there might be political uh, concerns about mm -hmm. uh, saying something openly, right? And also within Europe, unfortunately nowadays, right? So we are not going to mm -hmm. to, to like uh, uh, far uh, distant parts of the world. So yes, th this is true, and and I guess that also. In, in uh, social sciences and humanities, this is a, 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 let's say, a, a, let's say, bigger problem than in, in, uh, in STEM because uh, usually there it's all about just for formalism and numbers, right? While then you can have more, let's say, soft problems uh, you you discuss about. Yeah, this is actually one concern, uh, but um, probably. As, as Thomas said, there are more the benefits of being transparent and open than, than the negative effects. I mean, maybe it's a bit the point that you, you made um, before in response to that issue of making data um, open, that the needs to also be kind of care about exactly what is involved there. And in our discipline where you know, people often working with vulnerable groups and really, really delicate and politically uh, potentially highly problematic questions about what's revealed, what's said. And um, yeah, there just needs to be that put in somehow there as well. 
Yeah, okay. that's true. But if you consider, just, just a second, if you consider, so what is the, the idea behind having open data? It's not that everything is out there. Uh, of course, that would be ideal, but of course, in some cases, you cannot do it for different reasons, such as the ones you mentioned. But it, um, having the, 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 the knowledge that somebody already made that work, right? already worked on that and has some, some data that might be willing to share to a certain extent or just exchange information uh, informally, it's already good. Okay, So the fact that knowing that, people, that there is some data out there is is always uh, always good when in my previous life actually i, I was a, a researcher myself and sometimes i had to redo i, I used to do uh, computer simulations right around computer simulations. sometimes i had to rerun the simulations just because some authors didn't make their data available right and it's a, a complete waste of time <laughs> and so, so sometimes it's, it's very beneficial to have those uh, those available but there isn't, I would say, other people here could say if they, if they disagree, but there isn't really the analogy in our discipline. So if one person has worked in a particular context, um, somebody else working there, I, I don't know, just because it's so bound up with the subjectivity, which is important, it's not a weakness, as it might be seen in some natural sciences, that... I mean, you'd want to know about what, yeah, somebody has done, I guess, or the same, but it isn't quite the same sort of issue there. And it also means the re, the use of data by other people is 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 not so. Um, I guess it doesn't happen so much. It's not so vital to the discipline. It does happen sometimes, and certainly you want to kind of know about stuff. But I, it's also a view about what data is and are um so they're not seen as such um things just out there for the gathering of but a use by different people it's a different kind of relationship that's involved in much of anthropology i, I would say if i can this is sharon this is such a such a big topic actually the opening of data in anthropology that um uh, we would have a webinar uh, just about this, just a, among us anthropologists, uh, because there are so many things that uh, that we can tell uh, from the time it takes to open the data to all the dangers, and, and it's very specific to our discipline. But linked to this, actually, thank you very much for bringing this up. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Toma and Marco, what, uh, how, how do you think we can sort of um, adapt this sort of policy paper, which is very general, it's about incentives in, in general in open science. How we can, how would you expect us? How can we do to adapt it in within our uh, uh, research community so that it becomes meaningful? Because it's very abstract right now for for us. I mean, as, as you can imagine, as you can see from the questions as well. Um, so, what would be? I mean. We, we just had this initiative of uh, having a, a series of webinars, I mean, for how many people are turning around and trying to contribute. But we have no idea otherwise how to uh, stimulate a forum on, on this so that we can actually adapt what has been written and which we are going to, to have access to soon um, to our disciplines. So I don't know if you can venture on this. Thank you very much, Sir. Maybe I shall put you down in case somebody else is. <laughs> One, yeah, two. I think that speaks to the next steps that we want to take when, when the report is out and maybe Marco can say, say more about that. Yeah, I think that, uh, again, uh, of course, uh, different communities work in different ways, different uh, organizations work in different ways. There are different, uh, um, sometimes you have task forces, sometimes you don't. So I don't know exactly what your internal structures are, right? Um, but uh, in my opinion, one thing that is important is that the main message of, uh, of, of the paper we are going to publish is that uh, if you research, uh, research communities don't take the initiative, somebody else will, right? And it will be worse. Okay, so this is the, the, the main thing. Then. The details, uh, you might take uh, some recommendation as being relevant for your community and others not that relevant, and that's fine because, of course, you know your community much better than uh, we do, right? 
Um, what, so what is important is then uh, be willing, if, if of course there is the interest, to, to, to walk down the road and, and, and understand better uh, how you can uh, incentivize and reward the use of open science practices for your community. And then also get back to us and say, okay, this is what we found out, right? Because then you, you, you might do it by, um, let's say, having a conversation, a, a broad conversation with your members, maybe either through surveys, this webinar and other webinars might be uh, very valuable for that reason, right? You can uh, constitute task forces uh, within your, your organization to work towards uh, reaching at least one goal, right? And then one, once that, that's reached, it's another goal, right? It's, uh, it, it's, it's a long and winding road, as the Beatles used to say, right? So just, uh, just start. And then you, you will learn by doing. And, and of course, uh, um, there is the, the added value of, of being within ISC for two reasons. First of all, because we can try to support, uh, let's say, from the organizational point of view, you some, somehow. So, for example, by um, being in these webinars or, or, or sharing good practices, we can tell you, OK, you know what? Uh, for example, EGU is doing right. Even if it's from 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 STEM, they might have something valuable for you. And then meeting in, in uh, at some point we will have physical meeting. <laughs> I hope, right? So uh, meeting representative of other organizations and exchanges ideas because the pain points are more or less the same for organization. It's where do we start uh, from? How do we do that? Right and uh, and, and, and then how do I engage more uh, our members? These are all very difficult things to do, right? So I, I'm not saying in, in one day you will get there. No, I, I perfectly know that it's not the case. Mm. But again, if you don't start it, someone else will do. Because anyways, you, you, you see very well that there is a strong push in that direction, right? Mm. And it, it might be worse if, if you don't uh, take care of your community. Yeah, I mean... We ended up we, we ended up being abstract and general because really during the workshop it became apparent that there is no consensus. What should we how should we evaluate each other? I, I thought I personally was naively thinking we would find some answers, but we actually found the answer that there is no consensus. And so we don't prescribe what a specific community should do. And I think the plan is that the ISC will conduct a survey and hopefully we can gather input from different communities and maybe make another report where we put very different disciplinary solutions to the same problem and then this would be like a like a manual of good practice that could perhaps be adapted by others in, in your fields and you know maybe there is a field like I, maybe mathematicians say that we are fine there is no problem we, we don't need to change anything okay that's fine if there is a community that's entirely happy with the way things are done, it's already open. Okay, maybe there is nothing that needs to be done. That's that's a valid answer. But but there probably in most cases is something that could be done differently. And and some metrics that are used currently that should not be used. And so then we have to just ask, okay, what do you want to replace those with? And maybe in your case, you are in a relatively happy position compared to some other fields, but, but who knows? <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's mostly mostly that in, in anthropology, changing the culture, changing culture, it, it, it's such a strange concept to us, you know, and 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 pushing a transition while um, uh, normally we we expect things just to, to grow somehow naturally. It, it, it it's a very difficult concept. It's like culture and social engineering, and we don't always agree on on doing this. However, probably we do agree on the principle, so we want to get there. So. And your argument that it's better to go it our way than to let other people lead us uh, through things that could be as perverse as used to be this impact factor and all this hierarchy of science that got installed in the last years. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, you, you're right. We should take the lead somehow. Yeah, I mean to be honest, we are already late. I mean we are perhaps not too late, but we are already late. So these these mandates and these very high level policy making is is been happening for the past decade you know and, and these decisions have been made on the european level already years ago and and yeah they, they're somehow now just 
and we are also trying to you know ring the alarm bell to say that hey you should be aware of what is happening and you should be more active because otherwise you know this is going to be decided for you yes. and about pushing for the transition i mean <laughs> i totally understand what you what you what you mean but uh, actually we are also aware that it will take a, a generation anyways right because uh, of course it's very likely that in most communities, let's say, people in already um, tenure position for many years are not going to change much about the way they, they first do research and secondly, they, they do the evaluations, right? While younger generation might be more enthusiastic about that. Um, but we have spoken with people who, who made it like at a university level. So they, they change the whole strategy within the university um, and they they struggle they immediately had the buy-in of young uh, researchers and they struggle to have the buy-in of, of uh, older researchers so it it, it it all went through a co-creation process rather than like mandating what people should do right and uh, at least what we were told is that the, the, the entire process took a long time, uh, I remember it was three or four years, but eventually uh, they, they, they all agreed to go everybody in the same direction, right? Some less than less enthusiastically than others, but it worked out fine. Thank you very much. If are there some more questions or everybody needs to digest this? <laughs> Um, would you would you like us to to offer um, as, as a community like a, like a much more clear feedback on this draft when it's there or um, this is just for policymakers and we don't need to read it? Um, is there a way in which you would like us also to have from our part like sort of a joint feedback? I don't know under which form. Um, I'm can can we also do something? I mean, thank you very much for your presence today and, and, and your presentations. But can, can we give some feedback? Which is sure. I must say that already having you in the task force was really great because you already mm -hmm. provided like a bit of the perspective from from social anthropology, which I, of course none of us had, right? But of course, having the feedback of uh, the broader community is always important, right? So that's that's what I said earlier. We will circulate the draft to all our members, and uh, we'll ask all our members to collect the feedback from their own members, right? And, and send it back to us because that will certainly uh, increase the quality of, of the report. Great. Well, we shall do this then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you thank you so much. <laughs> well, if there are no more questions, we shall end it here. Thank you very much for your presence on a Friday afternoon. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to read the draft, actually. <laughs> thank yeah. you. We'll see it soon. Yeah, it's it's really it's really very much in the last meters. So uh, the fact that uh, Maria Leptin uh, got elected as ERC president right when we were finalizing the draft kind of threw our timetable under the bus a little bit because she was very actively commenting on the report and yeah and 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 also Michelle from from Embo has been very central person in driving the report. So they both both got Im immensely busy suddenly. So that has really delayed us a little bit, but we are a couple of weeks away, I think, from releasing it. It's, it's no problem. I do have, oh, okay. That's the thanks from the members. <laughs> we just, just get to public. Good. Thank you very much for all Thank you, Monica. Goodbye. Bye-bye.